Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today, my guest is author Patricia Posner. And we're going to be discussing the pharmacist of Auschwitz. Hi, Patricia. Thank you so much for joining Hi. us. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much for having me. Very much appreciated. Oh, my pleasure. Can you tell us how you came to write this book? Um, well, as a young girl living, being brought up in London, um, I was born just after World War II, so my whole family was really uh, participated in the war in one way or another. So it was all always drummed into us about the Holocaust. And I'm also, I was brought up um, modern Orthodox Jewish. And uh, it was, World War II was always a subject in the house, talking about it. And then years later, when um, I moved to New York and I met my husband, Gerald Posner, who's also an author, he was doing research on the book for Joseph Mengele, who was the angel of death in Auschwitz. And um, we got to interview a lot of people. And uh, he managed to get an interview with Joseph Mengele's son, Ralph Mengele. And um, I was very apprehensive about that. Uh, being brought up with an Orthodox Jewish home, you know, don't do this, don't go here. Uh, don't buy a Mercedes Benz. You know, it was. I was really, really uncomfortable. It was a. Uh, it was weird. I know. We're well, looking back on it now, but I was much younger. You're talking about 1985, so it was a different time. I was a different person. So I eventually did meet with him. He was extremely uncomfortable. So was I. And um, in the course of the conversation, he was talking about a German husband and wife pharmacist uh, who helped his father from Munich. Um, right after the war to escape, and they had happened to know um, Victor, Ke Victor Capesius, who had worked in Auschwitz. So, uh, and he said that you know worked there as a pharmacist, and I was like, wow, uh, you know, a pharmacist in Auschwitz. It it just was very odd to me that it was a pharmacy because I wasn't really thinking of you know the illnesses and the diseases there for the people that worked there, and that kind of planted the seed to think about a future project. And uh, so I did a lot of research uh, on and off for years, gathered information. And then, because at that period, I had always been working with my husband on all his books. Um, and then I embarked on my own solo book in 2000, which was a memoir of going through menopause without hormone treatment because of breast cancer in my family. Mm -hmm. So then it put it to rest for a little bit then and then five or six years ago from that part, a Romanian writer did a novel on Capesius. And so that rekindled my interest. And I found a small UK publisher that predominantly did World War II books, um, uh, Chrysler Sales. And uh, that took full time for me to do my research and writing. So that was about a year later I managed to do it. So that's really that, that you know that that's a little condensed story, but I mean you know you can imagine all the years of research and my husband did a book on Mengele and obviously he did a book on Hitler's children. So we've always been around that World War Two subject. Oh, exactly. But it must have been hard doing the research, especially yeah. coming yeah. across all the things that you have. What's really impressive about the way that you did this historical novel is the way that you show how the evidence was missed, but it, how, how and where it was along the way, which sometimes can only be found when we're looking back. So can mm -hmm. you take us a little mm -hmm. bit through that process? Well, uh, finding the evidence or finding the, well, the research, you know, was uh, very intense. Um, I did a lot of government archives in Germany, Romania, Britain, US, and then found a lot of independent researchers that dealt directly with these archives and these documents. Also, you know, there was high German and low German, so I had to get translators 
for many of the documents and rely on those translations that they were okay. And I had a very good, there's a man here, um, Trudor Parfleth, that runs the uh, Jewish Museum here that helped me tremendously. And uh, of course, the Fritz Bauer Institute, uh, named after the prosecutor Fritz Bauer, who's in my book quite a bit, uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Museum, private collections, uh, universities and then I tried to do interviews with as many people as I could and I did find three of uh, Capizia's daughters two of them were alive but they would not talk so it was a combination of all that and um, as, as I helped my husband with his research um, my husband helped me with the research as well so between the two of us we could you know parcel it between us I say you do this side I'll do it but it was hard it was very very hard um, because there are so many of these Capesius types, mm -hmm. but we only know about the Mengele or, you know, the high, you know, Rudolf Hess and people like that. We don't really know about these smaller little cogs. Right. And so they get lost in the woodwork. Uh, but he's not the only one. There are many more out there, I'm sure, but I have obviously haven't dived into them as of yet. Right. Well, for me, reading this book, I cried most of the way through it. I had to torture myself and read it all the way through once and then a second time slower. So yeah. I can't even imagine going through the documents and the things that you must have mm -hmm. saw along the way as you explained them to us. Look, I couldn't imagine being the investigator. It's, it's an excellent question. It was, um, you know, it really, it was very hard at times. Uh, I, it was emotionally draining, and you, you 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 read the documents and you think to yourself, Did, how could how could another person do this to a to people? I mean, what circumstances? What brings a person this depravity to do this? Um, I would get up, I would scream, I would cry. As you said, you would cry. Um, I learned a lot. I mean, I think that as much as I thought I knew about the Holocaust. Um, I learned a lot of stuff that I, that I could never even imagine. Isn't it was a very very hard thing to do, but I think having a partner like my husband and being able to talk it out. He's a lawyer, so he's much more rational than I am, and so I'm a very much more emotional person. And I all I could think of was, okay, I'm doing this for the dead and the living. So if they can get through, as you've read the book, you know how hard it was for those people to get through what they did. If they could get through that illnesses and those sickness and starvation and freezing cold and uh, uh, horrific times, then I can do it for them. I have to put, persevere. I have to continue. I think the other hard thing for me was looking through the pictures. Um, I know I've seen all those pictures of the, you know, the striped pajamas and all the, those types of things, but... There were, the pictures that really got me were the people coming to the railhead with their 60 or 70 kilos of belongings and thinking that they're being relocated and they're told to drop their stuff and they don't know that they're being walked over to where Victor Capesius would be and he was now doing the selections and this man would decide life and death. And the other scary part about it was, as you know, as you've read in the book, is a lot of these people he knew because he dealt with them in his everyday life as being a bare rep. You know, they would say, oh, there's Victor Capesius, he'll take care of us. So it was a shocking, shocking thing to have to research, yes, in, in that way. And also looking at the, I think if, if you say the piles of shoes and the piles of spectacles and the piles of, uh, you know, clothing, they, they just literally took everything from them dignity it just is and they went without thinking you know no one they never fought back it just was yeah it's just amazing it, it's really amazing. very emotional for me understandably and now what and about that, the part that um ig farben and bear played in this well, I think, uh, I think for me, the IG Farben thing was, um, I, I knew about it, but I really didn't know about it. Uh, you know, Farben was like the fourth biggest industrial conglomerate formed only like eight years before uh, Hitler became chancellor, which was 1925. And it's six big German, it's like pharmaceutical, chemical companies together. 
And the, and the other thing that happened there was that Hitler had such a bad relationship with Farben because there was this love-hate because there were so many Jews working there. And he just did not want to work with the Jews. And even when he was told that science would be brought back 100 years, he said, fine, then we'll deal with it, you know, 100 years without that, that no big deal. But he, there were just too many Jews for him around in that area. And Farben also needed the super plant. So they chose Monowitz, which is in Poland, and that was called Auschwitz III. So that was four miles away from the camp. And they, so you imagine this, they're walking to the camp four miles there and four miles back in these thin pajamas, these wooden clogs. Um, uh, they're going out there for slave labor. The Nazis, you know, they paid the Nazis for the, they paid, Farben paid the Nazis. And they worked about 25,000 to death. And, you know, again, it's really weird because Farben owns Bear, Capizis works for Bear. I personally can't look at Bear in a, in a supermarket anymore without like cringing, I have to say. I have to um, say I'm with you there. <laughs> it's very odd. It's very odd. It's, it's like, it's a very odd situation. I don't mean to say that, but it's very odd. So it, you know, one has to understand that Auschwitz particularly was all about money. It's making money. So whether it was stealing from the people or whether it was, you know, taking their hair and transferring that into knitting socks, um, everything was everything was about money, money, money. And to me, Auschwitz, when I think of it, is just a, one big graveyard. And it's just, it's, it's, they, they were so precise, the Germans. I mean, we have to thank them because they did, they did burn a lot of documents, but they saved a lot of documents for us. Mm -hmm. And the most bizarre thing, I think, in Auschwitz is the fact that they had traffic lights and you could get a traffic ticket. And I think it was Mengele, I think Gerald has it in his book, Mengele, The Complete Story, that Mengele gets a traffic ticket. So it's this almost bizarre, it's, 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 a, it's a very, it's very surreal because there was a normal life within the camp. You know, people lived in just off of the camp with their families and they would have gardens where they would grow, grow their fruit and vegetables or have their dogs and their cats. And uh, it just was a, I mean, that, that's another thing I found interesting. I didn't realize the, um, that Hitler had such a, a fondness for animals and that if you, vivisection, which is, you know, you use for experiments in, in chemists and pharmacists and that, he outlawed that and he outlawed anything to do with touching animals in any bad way. But not only could you go to prison, you could actually be put to death. So you think that he would think that about a dog or a cat, and don't get me wrong, I love dogs and cats. Right. But there's the, the the humans were in these just piled up in these camps, and it's just, it's just the whole thing was so his hate for Jews was so visceral, you know, so strong that he, he just couldn't see, you know. You know, that's uh, that's Farben for you. <laughs> wow. And with Capricious, how did he get away with it all? Is it that we don't have one place to coordinate all the evidence at the time? Well, I, think, I think with, as we spoke before about, uh, you know, let's say Capricious, there were so many, I mean, think of how many Nazis were working and how many got away. South America, uh, certain countries took them in for, um, you know, scientists and things. Uh, but for him, when he fled Auschwitz, even though he's captured by the British in May, mm -hmm. um, it was only in a, that was only a few weeks before the war was over. So you know, you've got millions of displaced persons. You've got German soldiers, refugees. It was chaotic. It was confusion. And Capizas was just really. I know it's hard to imagine. And until I brought him to life, he was a small fry. He wasn't on any wanted list. It wasn't like Mengele or all the other guys that got away, you know. So he was tried in absentia and sentenced to death in Romania. But the Brits let him go after a year in 1946. And then three months later, there was a survivor on a train track. And he looks over and he thinks, I know who that man is. He just recognized him. And he reported it. And so the Americans found him and arrested him and held him for one year, but they just couldn't make a case. 
So that after that, the Nazis, uh, the Germans, no, sorry, not Nazis, the Germans were going through what they called the denazification program, which was the German tribunals. So he he was ruled as a major offender, but he gets it reversed because he lies through the whole situation and says he was never at Auschwitz. So it was really hard to prove a lot of this stuff. They didn't have the proof. So I think it was in 1950, um, he was free. And what does he do? He's a druggist. He has his license. He opens a pharmacist in Germany. And, uh, and he's not caught until, um, I think it is, well, Fritz, uh, Fritz Bauer, um, no, no, Herman Langbein is um, on the hunt for him. So, uh, but it, it was, it was, um, you know, most Germans wanted to just forget about the World War II and bury the past. They felt, I mean, there was a handful of war, war crime trials by the American, the British was, it was enough punishment. They didn't want any more punishment. They didn't want to be reminded. Uh, as an example, in 1950, there was over 2000 open investigations. And in 55, the first year of the full German control, there was only 21 investigations and there was no interest. There was no appetite to go after Nazis crimes. They want, they wanted to move on. They wanted to not remember, you know, it was, it was a, it was a bad part in history and they didn't want to be blamed on mass for what took place. Right. And, and I think that's why Fritz Bauer in my book was such a, um, an important person, you know, the, the exception to the rule. Absolutely. I think it's important for people to remember history and, you know, I think what they can learn from your book, too, is investigators and lawyers of how to look for evidence and where else it might be because you had access to so many different sites of information and you really made it come together to show where Capricious lied along the way. And whenever I thought I was getting to a point where, because I look at historical novels and I'm like, okay, I'm going to catch this one. But it's right. not your opinion. You have right. factual references for everything. And it was impeccable. Right. It was really well done. And you, well, asked, you brought us more into the world at that time. And it was right. very scary because it could happen at any time. Um, I think it could happen any time, but I think here in America, I don't think we would ever let it happen. I think Absolutely. Uh, it, where, you know, it, it's an important story. You know, in this situation, you had a single man who was not, it, was, it wasn't a diabolical evil genius or a sadistic Nazi henchman. You know, it was just quite an ordinary man uh, capable of extraordinary crimes. And I think the lesson here is for people that, you know, evil, I mean, there is evil out there. And, you know, when someone loses their moral compass, I mean, what, what, where does it go from there? But I think we just have definitely checks and balances. It's different. I think people, I, I mean, I always say, because I'm Jewish, that, you know, I would fight back. And then, of course, the other lesson to learn is that you have, you know, um, the perseverance and dedication and the truth is embodied in the nonstop efforts from Herman Langby and Fritz Brown to bring them to justice. Uh, I don't think you're ever going to get rid of um, racism, anti-Semitic problems. I, I mean, I suffered as a young girl. I mean, people say to me, do you know what anti-Semitic problems are? And I say, yes, I went to school in England. I chose not to go to an all-Jewish girls' school. Um, my mother said, okay, then you'll go to an all-girls school. So I went to an all-girls school. And I have to tell you, I was very shocked when I went to school to be called dirty Jew, all Jews have big noses, uh, all Jews have big feet, um, head down the toilet, swastikas on my desk, uh, people wanting to fight. So, you know, that was, I was what, 15, 16 at the time. And so it's, it's I think it, it buries its head but I think it's always under the surface with some people and it just needs an excuse to come out. And Absolutely. that time, sorry. go ahead, sorry. Sorry, but that's the other side of the coin with your book. You actually show the good that came out with the people right. that, you know, were persistent. They didn't stop to seek justice. That the, you know, just that fighting for the truth 
was important. Yeah. yeah, I think it is very important. I think there's not, I mean, I don't know how many people are out there. I think, I think the sad part about that, I mean, why I'm happy I did this book is to bring to life someone like Herman Lang being a survivor who was a non-Jew political prisoner it was Auschwitz. After the war, he was relentless in chasing Nazis and gathered evidence, like you were talking about, sworn statements. He pressed the German prosecutors to bring charges. He was responsible for getting Mengele indicted in 1959. And of course, then in comes Fritz Bauer, uh, a Jewish prosecutor. And think of it, a Jewish prosecutor, the first post-war Jewish prosecutor. It's amazing when you think of it, or the yes. turnaround. And he had been in two camps during World War, and during the war before getting safely to Sweden. And he became the chief prosecutor in Frankfurt in 1956. And he arrested um, Capizis in 59. I mean, Bauer's goal was really to have a large trial of, of Auschwitz perpetrators brought by German prosecutors before German judges under German law and, you know, that becomes the great 1963-65 Frankfurt Auschwitz trial with Capesius and 21 others. And even then, Capesius is so odd. You know, he's in the courtroom wearing dark glasses because he says the light hurt his eyes from his incarceration. And that, and he's waving and he's smiling and he's laughing. And I have no idea what he's waving and smiling at. I don't know. I would like to know. But it's such odd bizarre, peculiar behavior, even, you know, because he really viewed himself as the victim. He was the victim. Uh, you know, it was a mistaken identity. I wasn't who I was. I didn't do anything. I think it was just in complete denial of what happened. Because, you know, this was an ordinary man, married with three children, uh, had no interest in politics, uh, were pharmacists, and got thrown into the camp. But I Thing. you know, this is, I'm not sure. I think what happens is that you're there one week and you probably feel, you feel physically and mentally sick. And then the week becomes a month and the month becomes six months and it just becomes second nature. And I think that's how he became so d disgusting in being able to take the gold teeth and, and parcel them up into little packages, 60, 75, uh, grams and send them to his sister in Vienna. I mean, he'd lost all his humanity, you know, and then he gets, when, when he was meant to go to- the scariest to part of your book is the loss of humanity. Mm -hmm. and yeah, then, I mean, it, it was heart-wrenching. It is, I mean, because you see him, you know, in the beginning when he's going to the railhead to collect possible medication, uh, you know, his depravity, I mean, slide into depravity is amazing because he's going through the, the Jewish people's personal, uh, you know, items at the ramp and he's looking for medicine and medical equipment. But then he starts, goes up one step further and starts stealing valuables. And, you know, and otherwise he's the, he's the chief, you know, otherwise he's the chief pharmacist. He's dispensing drugs for medical experiments and medical experiments where he, the phenol injection that was injected to the heart, you know, uh, and I guess the most horrific part is the fact that he was the one distributing Cyclone B, the colorless, odorless insecticide, which was eventually used to gas the Jews in the gas chambers. And, um, and as I said before, the 65, 75 pounds a day of jewelry, watches, etc. Uh, and all the, you know, it's all stored in the dentist, the dentist building, Wikipedia's. So, um, you know, and, I mean, what, 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 what's, what's his excuse? I don't know. I don't know. How do you go from being a sales rep to distributing Cyclone B and then selecting who lives and dies? I, 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 know. I, don't know, I, you, I don't know how you can do that either. I, I, yeah, I can't. I mean, I say personally, if I've got, you know, Hopefully, I'd never be in a situation. I don't. I think I would rather die. I think I would rather die. I would say, "Well, just kill me." You know, that would be it. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't take somebody else. Like, I can't even hurt an animal. You know? <laughs> so it's like, I know. You know. Yeah. So, you just, I think that's another thing that kept me up reading this book was that I was trying to find ways out of it, 
hoping that mm -hmm. the end would always change. Like mm -hmm. these people have to make different choices. You know, how could they have made it? And you, you know, you just look for the things that you would have done. Well, I think they always had an excuse, and you know, it's, it's a very famous line, I was following orders. And I think we hear that all the time. And I, I think, you know, in a free country like we live in a democracy or in England, it couldn't happen. But, right. you know, maybe in smaller countries are dictatorships or things like that, I don't know. Uh, but it is amazing that a whole country became this way. And I'm sure there were people there that did. They, they had no choice, they say. But, you know, it's a very, very hard, it is a very hard story to take in. It is, um, but I think it's a very important story to be told, Absolutely. as you said. You need to, um, and, and, you know, it was all about money at Auschwitz as well. So, you know, it was right down to, well, let's see if we can use, we used 20 canisters to uh, gas so many Jews in the in the gas ovens. So and let's use 15. What will happen? Well, it, it, it'll take them 20 more minutes to die. Um, and you know, and I was going to say she was, you know, moving out of that bit. But I was about to say that to think, even though he's sentenced to nine years, he only got two and a half years. And then when he goes home, and he's received by neighbors and friends the you know he goes to an opening and they stand up and start clapping him i mean why would you stand and stand up and start clapping him and he just lives his normal life i mean he was a he was a very bitter old man i mean he just he was very bitter but he lived till he was 85. so you know he lived a good, good old life uh with his wife and you know the other thing is you read in the book his wife you know, was half Jewish, which was very interesting to me. Uh, that you know, part just uh, blows me away. I don't understand. I don't understand well, that type of denial. No, I don't understand. And I think, Where you know, did he also, get the money, you know, especially well, for well, what, well, it, what they were making? Sorry. Well, uh, you know, from all the gold, you know, which I said to you, the gold teeth was 65 to 70 pint a day. With the jewelry, right. he they, they, he got so much out of there. I mean, it was hard for it was very hard for me to get through my head in the beginning. Okay, so he stole gold teeth, but how? But it's amazing when you think of six million people and what they're coming through. So these people that were coming there, that thought they were being relocated, remember, bought everything they thought was the most important things in their life. So me being Jewish, I understand that would be on a Friday night. They have their Shabbos candles. There would be gold. There would be silver. They would have the silver plate for the bread. They would, they would have linings in their uh, clothing uh, to, to hide things, uh, coins. So there was a lot of money there, you know, six right. million things, a lot of money. Uh, yeah. It's just that so, his wife never questioned that, never I questioned think, anything. No, I, think, I think they're all in denial. I think, I think they're all really, they were all really in denial. I think it was a very hard thing for them to stomach, but... It certainly, I, as a woman, it's interesting you say as a woman, because there was another part in that book that is never really talked about a lot, and I found was the fact that there were sex slaves. Wow. So, you know, and the Germans weren't meant to have relations with Jews. It was an offense. But, you know, the, the, place, the place ran in such a bizarre way. I mean, you've got, you've got women, they're sex slaves. They get pregnant. They have to have, you know, they, they, the women don't want to have the children. Then if they have the children, they start experimenting on the children and they start experimenting on the mother. I mean, it's just, it just there, there are so many other stories that you can just go off on. If you, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on. You know, because that story is really never spoken about. I mean, when they say the brothel, what brothel? It was a sex, they were sex slaves. They didn't choose to go to the camp to be uh, horse. Right. Uh, it's really, it, it just, it never stops. There are so many areas. And then I think the other part was when, you know, the people that worked in the camp, like the pieces and that, they took their breaks and they went away for vacations, holidays. And, um, and you see them laughing and drinking beer and playing their instruments and fun. And just like up the road, this is happening. It's, it's just, it's bizarre. And, I, you probably read in the part where he shot his friend's dog. 
I mean, they were more upset about that than anything else. You know, it's their values, the way they thought was so weird and misconstrued. I, it's, it's in, I'm happy I can't get inside their heads or their brains, especially for a shrink, I think. I know. So what's on the agenda for you next? Well, on the agenda for me now, fortunately and unfortunately, um, as you know, I write with my husband. I don't actually physically, but I do all the research we've done. His last book was God's Bankers, which is a phenomenal book. You should have him on for that. Um, we're doing a book now, or he's doing a book now, on um, Big Pharma. So it's pharmaceutical industry, and I'm his researcher, interviewer. And so for the time being, for the next year or so, it will be that. And then hopefully, what I'm really hoping for, if it comes to pass, I'd love to do a book with him. Um, something in the subject of World War II, because we both love World War II. And there's, there's lots more stories there to come out, you know. Uh, so that's what I'll be doing for the future. I, I, I love doing the work with him. We enjoy working together. Oh, that's fantastic. You've been together how long? Uh, we've been together, I think, he always remembers the numbers, <laughs> he's going to kill me if he hears this, I think it's 36 or 37 years. Wow. Uh, we really like each other. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, he's a great partner. I mean, he's, he's a given good person. I mean, we're just a, you know, when we met, we were completely different. We couldn't have been more opposite, but we've grown into each other's worlds beautifully, yeah. I'm very lucky we both are, yeah. Oh, that's so, yeah, great. long time. So we'll look forward to your next book together. And this was really well done. Thank you for sharing Thank so you. much of it with our audience. And on Thank a, you. Oh, no, it's our pleasure. But on a happier note, maybe. What was your favorite <laughs> book growing up of all time? Um, that's a really hard one because I like to, uh, like, um, Jane Austen books, Dickens books, you know, uh, Tale of Two Cities, Pride and Prejudice. I had such an eclectic taste, you know, um, Daphne du Maurier. You know, I come from a different generation. I was born in 51, so it was different. The books were different then. And, of course, my nonfiction, I'm biased, is, you know, my husband, wow. which would be Case Close, Killing the Dream. Wow. All his books. Yeah, that, that if you think this is well research and meticulous, meticulous, his books are beyond. I mean, uh, the research is well. He's a lawyer, was a lawyer by trade, so you know that's where I learned a lot of my tricks from. <laughs> wow, well, you did a great job. Congratulations on getting the truth out, and thank you again for your time today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for giving me the time and thank you for really reading the book and understanding the book. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank so, you. Bye-bye. Until next time, keep asking questions. The answers are out there. And if you want a really good historical novel, The Pharmacist of Auschwitz is the perfect novel to read. We'll see you soon.